Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Relationships Rock. Today, we have a very special guest, Rabbi Dr. Yossi Ives, who was recommended by one of you. He is an expert in relationship coaching with more than a decade of experience in numerous success stories. He's a qualified life coach and author, and he also offers individual coaching and has helped hundreds of singles worldwide. So we're so honored to have him on. Thank you so much for coming, Rabbi Yossi. And today we're going to talk about why singles get stuck. Hi, so real pleasure to be speaking with you today. What um, I'm here to address is a growing phenomenon that is now becoming so widespread that there's hardly a person who has not met someone who has been dating for a while, has been investing real-time effort and money into the process, and is finding that things aren't working out the, the way they imagined they would, the way that they would have hoped they would, and are beginning to realize that uh, there is a, a potential problem. And what I would like people to understand is that if you're dating for a while and it hasn't gone to plan, it's really important to ask why, not in order to find out who to blame, because nobody's to blame, but in order to understand what we can do that would maybe unlock the potential and give us a better chance of the kind of outcome that we're looking for. Okay, so what this means practically is not that people should look to transform themselves into somebody completely different to what they are. I always tell people, you are what you are. That's the way you've turned out. And for the most part, that's how you shall remain. And it's uh, naive and inappropriate even to tell people they have to be somebody different in order to be happy. My common go-to comment is, I'm proof that anybody can get married. So... Um, I really don't believe that the answer is if you were only better person, if you were only a different person, then somehow things would be different for you. At the same time, there still could be something often quite small, quite minor, that we need to be aware of. And by being aware of it, even if we are unable to change it fundamentally, we can avoid it, uh, having that silent control over our destiny. Just to understand how dating can sometimes trip us up how we can potentially react to things or perceive things in ways that are not to our advantage and this can come out in a very wide variety of ways that's why i use the term 50 different reasons not necessarily exactly 50 i've never actually counted but that it's a very wide variety of reasons that people can struggle starting with let's say certain communication difficulties which people may or may not be aware of and that small effort to get the communication to work a little better could be very effective to people who when it comes to making the commitment struggle to feel able to feel comfortable taking the plunge it feels terrifying to them they don't understand why and therefore prone to imagine that there's something wrong with the shidduch or something wrong with the person they're dating instead of understanding that that may be the way that their brain is wired to react but that doesn't mean they should let it run amok and just take over their their reaction even if that is not in their interest and there's everything else in between so today i highlight three common areas not because necessarily even they're the most common but there are three good examples of where people would get stuck and it gives us a window into the kind of things that are going on nowadays and before i do so i just want to emphasize you know we sound like we're being very rational here talking about stuck and unstuck and effective and ineffective as if this is some kind of machine it's not these are real people they're our own children they're our own brothers and sisters our own friends who are putting in everything they've got into dating, their parents, who sometimes are sacrificing thousands of hours of their time, the Shatchanim, who sometimes we don't appreciate the efforts that they make, who also sometimes are putting in tremendous amount into somebody without getting the result, and they also have to find a way to keep up their motivation. And then many other people within the Shidduch system, whether that's Mashbim, Rabbonim, coaches, all of whom are expected to be cheerleaders and to be available and to be motivated and to be patient. And they should. But we need to understand that we all need a lot of encouragement. We're all human beings. 
We all want just for ourselves and for others to be happy. And we're not looking to blame. We're not looking to criticize. But we really do want to understand better what's going on in order that we can get a different kind of result. Um, and whilst we're very compassionate and whilst we genuinely care, and it really pains us to see people trying so hard and not getting what they want out of it, we can't be so overcome with sympathy and so overcome with uh, love for others that we're unable to ask difficult questions, even if they require us to to go in places that we maybe don't want to go and ask kind of questions which maybe we would rather not have to ask, like, you know, what's going on inside of my head? Is there something about me that I need to be aware of that isn't working so well? And as much as I would love to be popular and um, like the most insecure man on the planet, I don't want anybody to think negatively of me. I'd rather sacrifice that if that means that we have people whose dating lives and really we're not talking about dating, we're talking about marriage and ability to raise a family and to have all the blessings of that, that that is more successful, even if it means that people don't like the person who asked the question. So I ask you forgiveness in advance. I love how you phrase that because I think a frustration that singles feel a lot is that they're kind of blamed for the fact that they're not married, you know? And when someone gets to... 28, 29, 32, sometimes even at 24, they feel like I've already given so much. Like I've already invested so, so much. I've been so vulnerable. I have gotten hurt. And there's like a lot of judgment and, and it kind of, I think, interferes with their ability to really look inside and say, hey, maybe there's something that I can work on. So I love how you kind of talk about this balance of at the same time, we have to be sensitive because these people, you know, singles, we have all been single once. I heard that phrase. Uh, we were all single at some point. Have to invest and it's very difficult and it's hard to always be opening up. Um, but at the same time, as as mentors or as coaches or as family members, people who care, you know, we also have to be honest um, in order to really look inside and be able to make some changes. Agree. Um, and I think language does matter and I try my best to to choose my words carefully. So I, I'm not a big fan of the idea that people need to grow. Um, we're not trees or plants. Okay, I'm not comfortable with the word working on myself. You're not a building site. You're not somebody's DIY project in the garage. Um, I, I'd rather that we talk about self-awareness and clarity and recognize that we're not trying to make anybody grow, which implies they're too small, they need to grow bigger or that they need to be worked upon, which means that they're faulty now and we're going to fix them. Much rather we focus instead on trying to give people the tools and the insights, which is something which everybody in any walk of life understands the value of. Even elite sports people, people who are making millions of dollars out of their talent, are constantly willing to, to come up with new ways of being successful. Even the top executives, especially the top executives who are running these billion-dollar companies, they all have executive coaches. They all recognize that when you're at the top of your game, everything you do carries enormous significance and you want to get it as right as you can. And so the idea that we're we're in the business of trying to equip people with what it takes to succeed as opposed to trying to make them into something different is absolutely central to this whole idea. Correct. And you know, the line I always tell people is it's not about making the right or wrong decision. It's about having clarity when you make the decision and feeling at peace with whatever decision you make. So on that note, let's dive in into what are your thoughts on, on the three main, or as you said, not main, but three very common reasons why singles struggle in dating. Okay, so one issue is that people may even be meeting highly suitable people. Not just they think it's suitable, but genuinely any reasonable person would say, that should have worked. They have so much in common. They each check off each other's boxes. Don't like that expression, but it's used often. Um, and genuinely, any reasonable person would have expectation from this shidduch. And yet it doesn't hit off. And what we need to understand is that the go-to reaction, maybe we need to review our selection criteria so that we maybe thought that this kind of person was suitable, or maybe we were wrong 
maybe we ought to go with something a bit different, maybe that would hit off better. That is a fundamentally mistaken approach because in the vast majority of cases, that is unlikely to be the explanation. It is not about replacing the guy or the girl on the other side in order to get a different reaction. It's understanding that in order for a shidduch to succeed, it's not enough for certain criteria to be met. At the end of the day, this isn't a product you're purchasing. This is a relationship you're building, and it requires that relationship to take off. And you're taking two complete strangers who've never seen each other before, and you're hoping that in a very quick period of time, there's going to be a shift, and they're going to go from being complete strangers to having um, the intention of spending the rest of their lives together. And that is something which is not to be taken for granted. It's not obvious. and It requires a certain dynamic, a certain type of electricity to, to be generated that is able to connect them and, and fuse them into one. And obviously, you don't become a couple just by dating. You become a couple by the whole process of engagement and marriage and building a, a life together. But there has to be something that begins during dating for people to feel ready to you know, invest further in the relationship. And this lack of emotional connection can come from a variety of reasons, and it would take a long time to give you full overview. But let me give you an example. Um, you could have a person who maybe grew up in a home and the mother was ill, or maybe even, God forbid, passed away. Or maybe the marriage was unstable, or there were some other problems in the home. And this young lady became the second mother, or maybe the actual mother, and became very responsible at a very young age to hold the family together, to almost raise her siblings, to you know keep order in the home, and did a remarkable job at doing that, and heroically saved her own family, uh, captained her own ship at a very young age, and while I have tremendous admiration for people like this, in fact, I would say they're my real heroes. It's not the case that they don't pay a price for it. There's a very serious risk that in order to be able to manage, they've had to put their emotions to one side, essentially lock them away in a safe in order to be able to handle it. Because otherwise, at a very young person, those emotions, those feelings of neglect, of being overwhelmed, of anxiety, would overwhelm and would make, make it impossible for, for the person to handle things so well. Remember, these young people are truly heroic. They not only are able to hold on the family in this way at a very young age, they often go to school and do well in school and come out top of the class. They're convinced that the last thing that they need to do is fail so that, so that um, you know, her parents would then feel distressed at 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 at, their, at her failure, and so they, they push themselves on every front to be the best, and never to drop a single ball, and that's an amazing accomplishment. But then they come to marriage, and now you need to find those emotions to be able to build a connection, and sometimes they don't even know where they where they've last seen them. It's been years since they were ever connected with their emotions, and so they're an impressive person. You could admire them tremendously and they have like the strongest skills they're usually highly articulate highly responsible highly efficient highly intelligent they've got everything going for them but this is not about hiring somebody this is about marrying somebody and then the lack of emotional connection becomes a real liability there are lots of different reasons why this could happen that's just an extreme example although sadly not so uncommon but in general, I talk about people lacking resonance, this idea that when we go on a date, we're not just sharing ideas. We're not just sharing information. We're not just getting to know each other. We're actually building some kind of emotional connection. And the way that's done, in part, is subconscious. It, in other words, to say it's happening without the person even realizing it. For example, when you like somebody, your eyelashes flicker at double the rate. Um, when you like somebody, you 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 smile like five times as much. Um, you'll giggle. You'll you'll make you know sort of cute remarks. You'll change your whole body language. Will become more disarming and more friendly. So many things are going to happen. The person doesn't even realize. 
even the idea of mirroring, that you start to even speak like the other person, you find yourself using the same language, similar words, you even sit similar, that the person's whole body and whole mind becomes attuned to how can I narrow the gap between me and this other person? And all of that is having a triggering effect because as I'm doing this, the other person's reacting to me. And so it becomes a, a virtuous cycle of growing closer and closer. But somebody has to create that. And if somebody's blocked and that doesn't kick off and they just sit there being very polite, but not having that reaction, and the other person won't necessarily have the reaction to their reaction. And so the whole thing gets stuck. And that's when we get so many people saying it, it really adds up on paper and we had a perfectly good time and we got along great, but I'm just not feeling it. it, it you know, this person would be a great friend, but I just can't see this romantically. And that's something which is usually because there's something within the person that is stopping that from happening. It could be, for example, a fear of opening up. It could be, for example, a, a fear of trust mm -hmm. where we're maybe for different reasons, reluctant to really let a person feel that they are welcome to ask us anything. And so because we're conscious that if we do allow ourselves to give that more emotional invitation, that that will invite the person then to feel that they can ask us anything, and we don't want them to do that, then we'll, that we'll instinctively look to keep things at a, at a more respectful level instead of really getting tr truly close to somebody else. And so the list is quite endless. And what needs to happen in situations like this is for people to, first of all, be aware, because most people, from what I've seen, when this is happening, are not aware it's going on. In fact, on the contrary, they believe it must be they're, made, they're meeting the wrong people, or that people are just judgmental and don't accept them for who they are, which is also rarely the case. And instead, to look to how to manufacture this resonance, how to build that connection, how to generate more closeness. So these things can be done and people can develop basic insights and skills to be able to do this. And even somebody who's not naturally inclined towards this. So this is not their, their go-to reaction when it comes to dating. And so even if they do have the insights and the tools, they won't necessarily be as proficient to somebody for whom this is their just normal thing. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be perfect at it. You just have to make a little bit of progress. Even 10% better can be enough to make the difference between this being something which doesn't go anywhere and something which can really take off. And once it takes off, it can really, you know, speed off itself and it can go quite well. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes people kind of expect that emotional connection to just happen um, spontaneously or, or immediately kind of like effortlessly. And I, I think sometimes there are things that we're doing to kind of block off the the receiving aspect right like when people are quote unquote um connecting with you flirting with you they're they're giving to you and there has to be an aspect of of receiving as well that kind of leads to this emotional connection and you're absolutely right the first step is being aware of what am i doing to either um allow the emotional connection to flow or maybe i'm kind of giving signals totally unconsciously of saying i'm not interested like I, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to kind of take that step. And, and especially when I, when I speak to older daters, there's almost like a fear of opening up too early on or to connect too much because it hurts when, 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 when there's rejection, it's this balance of, I, I have to open up, I have to give in order for, to let anything succeed. But at the same time, I don't want to get hurt. And I want to add one more thing, you know, when you were talking about the girl who lost a parent or has kind of had to become that parent and push aside her own wants and needs, it also hit me like, wow, this is an example of somebody who hasn't really been receiving. They haven't been asking for their needs. They've almost have become used to just giving and giving and giving and not receiving. And I know I sound like a broken record. I've mentioned already in a few episodes, but receiving is such an important way to give. And sometimes when people who are used to kind of being independent and strong. And again, like you said, successful and achieving in everything when it comes to someone trying to give to them, for them having to be more vulnerable, more real, more open, it becomes really scary. And I could see how that could prevent them from really connecting to someone. 100%. And especially what you said at the beginning, um, 
the greatest gift you can give to somebody is being willing to accept them. And that means their compliments. It means their interest. Um, if when somebody shows an interest in you, you react with uh, suspicion, that's a huge um, uh, discouragement to the other person. I asked a question, trying to show an interest in them. And instead of that being welcomed as, well, of course, he'd be interested in me because I'm such an interesting person and I'm a nice person and I'm a likable person. No, our reaction can be, why is he asking that? Like, what's his problem? And you don't have to necessarily even do anything or say anything, but just if the way that you're reacting in your facial muscles and your vocal tone doesn't uh, display a, a, a warmth, the other person will pick up on it. And remember, it doesn't have to be anything major. This is the whole point. We're talking about subtle things, but dating is subtle. And so if you're doing a scientific experiment, you get one small little thing that you know, doesn't follow the protocol, the whole thing can have a totally different uh, um, outcome to what you intended. Dating needs to be very nuanced. And, and, and we've got a lot of things that we have to, to, to be able to do to get the reaction we want. Um, thankfully, most of it happens all, all by itself. It flows naturally. But when it doesn't, we need to be aware and m make a, you know uh, take the steps to put that into place. So for anyone who's listening now and they say, wow, that's me. You know, I'm really struggling with that emotional connection. What would be some like quick tips, you know, like three things you could do that are super easy, super nuanced, like you said, once you're, once you take awareness of like, okay, I'm doing this, I'm blocking off the emotional connection. What could you do on dates that could allow? Before we listen to Rabbi Yassi's answer, and trust me, you're going to want to stick around for that. I want to just give a shout out to our sponsor, okclarity.com. Okclarity.com is the place for any Jew, no matter how from or religious you are, to find a top-notch therapist, psychiatrist, coach, or nutritionist, and it's completely free. Okclarity.com's professionals are vetted and have extensive experience working with the Jewish community. If you're in the market for a therapist, coach, nutritionist, psychiatrist, or the like, or if you are a therapist, coach, psychiatrist, medication provider, or nutritionist, you must check them out at okclarity.com. I have to be very brief here, um, and I want to also acknowledge that everyone's a bit different, and so what I'm saying is not necessarily going to be correct for everybody, even even any of the three things I'm going to say necessarily going to be correct for everybody listening to this. But one thing is to be more ready to compliment. When I speak to people and I ask them, I had this just yesterday, so have you told her what you think of her? Because he was telling me all these amazing things about her. And I think, have you ever told her? And I had this like, no. I said, from the way that you said that, no, I said, I get the impression that you realize that you're not so com com confident about that. No, right. Um, and I got that kind of knowing silence, right? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot of explanation for that. You, you, you got me, you know, if I'm going to say these nice things to you, and you're a 49 year old married man, it's kind of the wrong audience, right? The person who needs to hear this is the person I'm dating. OK, so that's start off with that. The next thing is um, to, you know, be more conscious of how you're coming across. You know, people do sit back. They do give a sort of distant, indifferent um, signal. Um, so because we, you know, we know this is something we could do, we come to the table with a very conscious decision before you show up. I'm going to lean forward. I'm going to show an interest. I'm going to push myself beyond what I feel comfortable because whatever I feel comfortable is probably not enough. So to um, come with an intention of whatever I feel comfortable doing, do that and 50% more. And, and finally, um, I have a whole list of ideas around how to build connection. Um, but sometimes it requires people to do things that they would think crazy. I've come up with some ideas that admittedly I'm not the most playful person, so maybe others should come up with better ideas. But some of the ideas I came up with were designed deliberately to provoke. Like, for example, do I have a contest about who can stand longest on one leg, right? That sounds like a stupid thing to do, but, you know, sometimes you have to let let some kind of playfulness come into it just to, to, to change the dynamic, Right. You know, go on one of those 3D simulator rides. One of my better ideas is to go to one of those costume places where, you know, you dress up like you're in the 18th century, right? 
you know, do things that allow you to kind of be almost silly, playful, to be childlike, to try to you know, move away from this idea that it's this exchange of, of, of minds and try to find a way of connecting on, on, on a more emotional level um, and a more childlike level. Because in the end of the day, you can tell how successful a date is by how much they're behaving like kids. Right. And and we're, we're too sensible and too responsible and too proper. I don't mean in the sense of behaving the way you should on a date, of course. But good daters know how to lighten the mood. And that's something which you can't always do if you don't have the personality. But you can come up with stupid ideas like the ones I just did that maybe create that. And it's hard not to be silly when you're standing on one leg. It just, you know, you're not a flamingo. Yeah, I, I totally love that. You should know, I actually tell people to go to children museums for that reason, <laughs> because they're so fun and so interactive. Um, I also love how you were saying about that, the complimenting and the body language. So we actually had an episode on kosher flirting and we spoke about, I had a uh, Hana Kahana on and we spoke about literally taking off your coat, you know, like, like, like not keeping it on in your body language, giving compliments. And it was funny because the response was no, but that's just normal decency, like basic. And what we kind of responded was, yeah, but you don't realize how many people don't do that. You know, how many people don't give a compliment and then the other person smiles, like you said, with the eyelashes, with the smile and says, wow, thank you so much. I, I really appreciated that. A hundred percent. Okay. If we go on uh, quickly to the other examples, which are only just examples, but common ones that uh, people uh, talk about when they're struggling and I can tell that they're stuck. And the issue of physical attraction, it's a big one. I could talk about this for hours. That's um, honestly a huge one. And the one that most people really feel like that's where they kind of get really stuck. Okay. But here's what I want to say to you, not to you, to your listeners. We have this back to front. I mean, literally 180 degrees. So if you want to know the truth, just listen to what other people are saying and just do the opposite. Here's how people think. They think that the reason why they're not in the relationship with the person is because they're not physically attracted. What they don't understand is this exact opposite is true. They're not physically attracted because there's something inside of themselves that is preventing them from being able to feel attracted to this person. Now, I'm not naive. Not everybody is going to be attracted to everybody. And physical attraction is an actual thing. And it is true that there are certain objective criteria for attraction. Um, by that, I mean to say, if you were to take a thousand people in Times Square, you will find a remarkable degree of consensus about what people find attractive and do not find attractive. So this is not to say that attraction is entirely an imaginary thing. What I'm saying to you is the people who come to me and are talking about physical attraction are typically not dating people who you would say are objectively unattractive. It is not that they've been paired up with the the, the, the least um, appealing people on the planet. Quite the reverse. In many cases, they've they've been dating highly attractive people, who that same cohort on Times Square would say, "What are you talking about? She's gorgeous, or he's really handsome, right? Or he at least there's nothing wrong with his appearance." Or especially, I say this: the people who maybe dated dozens of people. Every single one of the people you dated, you saw the picture before you went. So clearly, you agreed to meet them. So the attraction part must have been there at least at face level. And somehow or another, but when you meet them, all of a sudden, it turns out that they're much less attractive than their photograph. That is not plausible. And so it's not helpful to imagine that the lack of physical attraction is the problem. The problem is that if we are stuck within ourselves... In other words, to say that there's something about our own way of dealing with um, connecting and with entering into a relationship is stuck, then the attraction part is going to be one of the main reasons why we end up feeling dissatisfied. In other words, to say that if the connection was there, if the person felt part of this, they would be much less ready to 
complain about sometimes minor minor issues that they would rather different. In other words, I'm not suggesting that when they say, you know, he's got a slightly unusual nose. Yeah, maybe he does. Yeah. But let me assure you, if you had a good relationship with this person, that would be the last thing you're worried about. It's because there's something missing in the relationship that the physical attraction has become a problem. Or to put it a different way, many people find that even though they genuinely want to get married, but there's something about the process of dating that they struggle with, and they therefore put the appearance uh, or some other more external aspect, maybe their sense of humor or something else. In some cases, you know, particular type of intelligence as such a high priority as a way of trying to compensate them for their own lack of internal motivation. And this can happen over and over again without anybody even as much as questioning it. Instead, we end up just resorting to insults like she's picky or he's choosy. It's just completely missing the point. Why are they doing that? Are they doing that because they're um, masochistic? They have this desire to ruin their own life? Like, that's crazy, okay? If they're doing this, then this, despite the harm it's causing them, there must be a reason. And until we understand the reason, we're kind of stuck. And everybody's a bit different. But the bottom line is, in the vast majority, and I'm talking about 99.9% .9 of the cases, if somebody's stuck with this issue for this many months and years, then it's not simply a case of they've just been really unfortunate to have met all the unattractive men and women of, of this country. And more likely, there's something within themselves that is not allowing them to connect in the way that they would like. And so the physical issue has become a problem. And rather than focusing on the symptom, which you, you, you won't even help because there's nothing you can do, you'd be much better off trying to understand the cause and give the person the insight and the awareness that they need to be able to move forward. Yeah. Wow. I totally love that. I feel like a lot of listeners are really going to connect with that. Um, and I think that especially it's, it's Dafka, the quote unquote people who are picky and who are literally, you know, very particular with who they want to date that they kind of struggle with this lack of um, physical attraction. And as time goes on and they get older and older it becomes harder. They kind of express stronger frustration of, I'm just not attracted. I'm not attracted. It's not there. And they kind of, in a way, even up the bar of what the criteria is, because they feel like that's going to get them more satisfied. And I love how you said, it's not that because the physical aspect is lacking, the relationship is lacking. It's because the relationship is lacking that the attraction feels like it's lacking. It is lacking them because, because, they, 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 because they don't have the relationship. And all they have is the physical. So that's what they're obsessing about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not saying that they're entirely imagining it, like they made up imperfections about the person that don't exist. But they don't understand that this would not be happening if they were having different kinds of relationships with people. Correct, correct. Um, so I know that we, you know, when we, when we had spoken, we had also talked about the mismatch of religious values. I don't know, side point. I don't know if you have time to talk about that now or you want to kind of end it off here. Let's just spend a few minutes on this. Um, okay. By the way, I'm going to edit, so, so don't worry. This <laughs> this part won't okay. be out there. So religious values um, are, are obviously a big deal. Religious values encompasses quite a few things. It's not just, you know, Kashra Shabbos. There's many, many different ways um, that people have expectations. I spoke to a woman only yesterday who said as she's concerned she would only be interested in dating somebody who learns every day i was like wow okay um that's you know that's not so simple not every guy even people who are capable of learning and you spent many years in yeshiva after being out of the system for quite a number of years maybe that was once a week but every day sitting and learning not everybody's going to do that so we see that there is the um, opportunity here for people to find themselves misaligned when it comes to religiosity. And so I want to say something which is now becoming a kind of habit of mine, three out of three on this call, of saying it's back to front. We've got it completely the wrong way around. The way that people think of it is this. 
let's look at your values and my values and let's compare, right? If the values match up well, we have a fit. And if they don't match up well, well, then we don't. So it should be possible theoretically for anybody to be able to make an assessment of whether the religious values thing is a, a go or not. It's a case of you put it all down on a, um, his and hers um, across 30, 40 religious questions. And you, you, you can simply count the number of things that match and things that don't match. That is completely false. The question is not the religious values. The question is the people. There are two types of people. And there's a spectrum. On the one side are people who are very rigid and unrelenting. And as they're concerned, if it doesn't fit what they're expecting, then we have a problem. And there are people who are more forgiving, more flexible. And as far as they're concerned, they can handle something different than what they themselves would want. And we're not talking about people who are flexible and that they will throw away their own standards to please somebody else. It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who's able to say, these are my standards, which I want to be respected, but I'm okay with the fact that you're different and that doesn't threaten me and antagonize me. There's a well-known book called I'm Okay, You're Okay. And the basic idea is this. Somebody can say, I'm okay and you're okay. We're not the same. So how's that possible? Because it's okay for you to be you and it's okay for me to be me. And so therefore everything is fine. And when people come to me and say, is this a religious difference something that is unbridgeable? Is this religious difference something I should be willing to concede? Is this religious difference something that I should stand my ground on? And I get asked like a hundred questions of one variation or another of the same theme. And every time I say to them, tell me about yourself and tell me about the person you're dating. I don't care about the religious differences. Obviously, if you're Shema Shabbos and the person is not, you wouldn't be asking the question. You know the answer to that, okay? Right? We're not talking about where you want to be part of a, of, 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 of a community and this person wants to live out live out in, in, in a, you know, on, on, on a 30 acre ranch in the middle of Oklahoma. We're talking about differences which are not extreme. And the reason why they only they become a problem is because the people in question are either comfortable or uncomfortable with the idea that somebody they marry would be different to themselves. I'm actually not even telling people what to do. It may be that genuinely their personality is such they don't really handle somebody being too different to them. And it's all very well you know, me saying or somebody else saying, let it go. What if they can't? You know, what if it's just not in their nature to do so? Who's taking responsibility for their shalom bias? So I'm not promoting necessarily that everybody just ignores their concerns. I'm saying self-awareness, clarity, step back for a moment and say, okay, it's not the other person, it's me. Am I able to accept them? Start with that. Then truthfully, can he accept me? Can she accept me? Because if yes, I can accept them and we can live a perfectly normal existence. And I've told people, I'm very open about it. You know, I married somebody more pious and devout than myself. Right? And I say this even though it doesn't make me look good in a way, because I think we have to be honest. Right? I married now for more than 25 and a half years. I don't think my marriage is particularly uh, problematic. And we acknowledge very early on that we have certain differences, but that we could respect each other and we could accept each other. And we've survived, more than survived. Okay, it has not been a problem. Um, and so I think it's very important that people don't create a problem where it doesn't exist by saying, well, there is this difference. You're not denying it. There is this difference. So what do you have to say for yourself? I'm saying, I have nothing to say for myself. The difference is a matter of your personal view of it. If you can't handle it, I guess it's a problem. And if you can, it isn't a problem. I'll tell you a little story on this I shall end. A young lady told me that she was dating a very from really 
pious young man. And on the third date, he noticed that her skirt was a little shorter than what he thought he imagined would be the dress code for the person that he would marry. And it bothered him. So he went to his religious mentor, Mashbia, and explained that he'd noticed this and he wasn't sure how to react to it. What is uh, the advice? And the Mashbia told him, from what you're saying, there are many other things that you like about this person. I would not make an issue out of it. You would think that would be the end of the story, but it's not. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a story. The story is that he then goes on the date and he says to this young lady, you know, on the last date, I noticed your skirt. It bothered me. I went to speak to my mashbia. And my mashbia told me, etc. So therefore, I want you to know that I accept you exactly as you are. Don't change a thing. And I was so impressed. But the bottom line is some people, they're not ready to say that. And I have to respect that too. And if that's how they are, who am I to tell them that they should feel differently? But you can see how it's possible for people to still hold true to who they are, but take a decision that they can, they can accept another person for being who they are. And in the truth is that in the end, when it comes to marriage, ultimately we're going to have to learn to do this. That is the truth of the matter. It's only a matter of how quickly we learn it, whether it happens in the first day of marriage or the first week of marriage. But in the end of the day, we're all going to have to realize we can't control the other person, and nor should we try to. And so eventually we should come around to the idea that if we're going to make every issue in dating, every minor difference, a cause for a showdown, a cause for a crisis, I don't have much confidence for those people in marriage. So I'd rather they learn the skill of compromise and of mutual acceptance early on. It's not a bad skill to have in life anyway. Wow. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I should have been taking notes here the entire time. Literally, uh, Rabbi Dr. Yossi, I have so many mic drops. Like I have so many follow-up questions and comments I want to say. I want to, first of all, thank you for your time really to coming on here and sharing all of this with us. And I am going to link all of his information on the show notes. If any of you want to reach out, um, he does do dating coaching sessions. You guys could reach out to him directly. Thank you so much for coming on. Hi, everyone. It's Raquel from the future. I'm recording this after having listened to that amazing discussion, conversation by Rabbi Yassi. You guys should totally reach out to him. I also want to give another shout out to our sponsor. If you have WhatsApp, OK Clarity has an amazing WhatsApp status with thousands of obsessed followers. Their WhatsApp is a free way to improve your mental health, and they post great humor so you'll laugh too. If you have WhatsApp, shoot them a message at 917-426-1495. Again, that's 917-426-1495. We'll put the links to the website and WhatsApp in the show notes. Smash those links. You won't regret it. And I look forward to speaking with you soon. Mm-hmm.